Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Bryce Duskit and thank you for joining us today on Market Journal. We are on location for today's show. The 2022 Cattlemen's Ball of Nebraska is taking place this weekend here in Weeping Water. We'll have details on the annual event that raises funds for cancer research coming up here in a bit, but first. The U.S. Department of Agriculture recently announced that the commodity and specialty crop producer that were impacted by natural disaster events in 2020 and 2021 will soon begin receiving emergency relief payments. Those payments for the Farm Service Agency's new emergency relief program total approximately $6 billion. Back in September of 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Extending Government Funding and Delivering Emergency Assistance Act, which included $10 billion in assistance to ag producers that were impacted by wildfires, droughts, storms, and other eligible disasters during 2020 and 2021. So if you received an indemnity either through crop insurance or through NAP in 2020 or 2021 for various different natural disasters, it could be drought, it could be wildfire, uh, it could be excessive uh, flooding. Um, if you received an indemnity, you're eligible for uh, the emergency relief program. The Farm Service Agency has sort of streamlined this process this time around. So we have pre-filled uh, applications. Those went out in the mail a couple of days ago. They should be arriving in mailboxes as soon as today or, uh, or maybe next week. Uh, and once producers get those, uh, there's some boxes that they need to check and some, some uh, documents that they need to sign. But then we encourage them to go back into their office as well. There's a list of documentation that they need to have on file, I think within 60 days of, the, of their eligibility being determined. Uh, and there's a, a pretty significant list, uh, Bill, but just to make sure that those are on file so that they can get signed up into the program. This program is designed to bolster indemnity payments for the 2020 and 2021 calendar years. These relief payments will come in two phases, with phase one currently being implemented and phase two in development. In the earliest forms, they'll be received by producers. They'll pertain to producers with crop insurance coverage. So uh, phase one is uh, uh, a program that is, again, designed to sort of uh, bump up your indemnities that you receive for 2020 and 2021. Um, the phase two has not yet been determined. They're still working through that, uh, still working through what kind of uh, program that uh, they'll be rolling out for that. That'll be probably coming later in the summer. And just to be clear, the, the documents that are going out right now are for indemnities that you receive for crop insurance. If you had NAP coverage, you're gonna receive that application, those application materials a little bit later in the summer as well. We're trying to get this first tranche out uh, with the crop insurance uh, application, or excuse me, the crop insurance indemnities uh, more quickly because frankly, there's a lot more of them. For crops covered by crop insurance, the ERP phase one payment calculations will depend on the type and level of coverage obtained by the producer. These calculations will use an ERP factor based on the level of the crop insurance or an NAP coverage. Most importantly, however, producers will need to find time to get into their local FSA office as soon as possible to ensure that they, that they have everything they need in order. So the, the ERP payments are calculated using a factor based on the level of coverage that the producer had um, when they were indemnified for that loss to begin with. Uh, and then that factor is applied and it can go up to 90% of the loss. So uh, after you receive this uh, payment, you're required to be in the program uh, then for an additional two years uh, beyond when this payment was received. So just to be sure that your, your uh, viewers uh, heard this the first time, the, even though they're getting this pre-filled application in the mail, they'll need to go into their local county office and make sure that all the forms are in place. The second round will fill gaps and cover producers who did not participate in or receive payments for the existing programs that are being leveraged for phase one implementation. When phase one payment processing is complete, the remaining funds will be used to cover gaps identified in, under phase two. Additional USDA disaster assistance information can be found online. The website is farmers.gov. This includes the disaster assistance discovery tool, disaster at a glance fact sheet, and the farm loan discovery tool. Moving over to the grain markets now, this week we are joined by Luke Beckman of Central Valley Ag. Well, Luke, last week we seem to have some bullish sentiment in the markets, 
As we have this conversation today on Wednesday afternoon, it seems like the Bears are holding things back. What's your current take on the situation? Well, Bryce, I feel like it's really a momentum conversation. This market is continually needing bullish information to push it to new heights. And really the planting season or wet planting season for the North has more or less run its course. The price action is telling you that it's not really concerned about you know, the acreage situation in the Dakotas and Minnesota. And so we're starting to see uh, some of that bearish momentum come back into the marketplace. And if you look at open interest data, really for the last several trading sessions dating back to last Friday, you're starting to see open interest increase as prices move lower. So that really tells us that there's some new shorts coming into this market, um, which is different than the trading behavior that we've seen in this long running bull market. So uh, it's really a question of momentum. Fundamentally, not a lot has changed with this market, if at all. Uh, but we just don't have any bullish inputs in the near term to really push us as we move into June. We'll need to see some weather risk or weather premium come back into this market as the forecast change. But for now, you're really seeing a cool forecast with ample precip uh, to really get this crop started in pretty good shape. Look, when it comes to the uh, uh, weekly crop progress reports, you mentioned to me there's only a couple of states you're really watching on that front. Which ones are those? Yeah, you know, we were behind early, Bryce, in the planting season, getting corn and soybeans in the ground. But really, the, the nation's caught up pretty quickly. Uh, really, North Dakota and Minnesota are your key concerns at this point. Uh, you know, the USDA had them at 56% planted in North Dakota, 82% in Minnesota. And then on the soybean side, 23% in North Dakota and 55% in Minnesota. So really those two states uh, have been problematic. They're excessively wet. You're definitely gonna have some prevent plant acreage uh, in both South Dakota, North Dakota and Minnesota. So the question is how much? It uh, feels like we've picked up some corn acres from what the USDA would have reported at the end of March. But I also think we're dealing with some additional prevent plant acres that they probably weren't counting on, at least when they put the numbers together at the end of March. So net net, where do we land? Are we going to be close to that 89 million acres that they reported at the end of March? That's going to be the big question that we uh, have yet to see. Uh, the, you know, we're going to see that at the end of uh, June when they release the planted acreage report. Uh, that survey is going to be taking place in early June. Uh, so really an interesting set of data that the market's going to be anticipating as we get a few weeks down the road. Before we get to that point, though, we have to talk about the June supply and demand report. Yeah, and we'll do so here in a minute, but I want to go to something we've got some news on the ethanol front, Luke. What can you share with us about that? Well, there was a headline today, Bryce, that the Biden administration is really looking at upping the uh, blending volumes of ethanol into our gasoline supply. They're basically looking at volumes that have been blended in up to this point in this 2021 uh, year. And so uh, likely that they're going to raise the obligation from 13.3 billion gallons to 13.9. Uh, that news broke today. Uh, you're probably asking then why why were corn futures down so hard? Uh, really, you know, the blending requirement is more a compliance situation. And so you saw the renewable identification number of the RINs. That market was up about 11% on the news, basically because if you're a blender, it's going to require you to blend ethanol into the fuel supply. Or if you're unable to do that, you have to buy credits uh, to replace your obligation. And so those credits were up on that news that potentially we're going to be blending more ethanol into the fuel supply in calendar year 2022. Well, Luke, you teased the next World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report is coming out June 10th. What are going to be the numbers you're most interested in when that report comes out? Yeah, so this June report is just their regular run of the mill update of global supply and demand balance sheets. Of course, the U.S. is included in that. Really, you know, last month was the first time we saw the new crop. Uh, balance sheet. That's the first time they published the 22-23 uh, new crop estimates. Really wouldn't expect a lot of changes to the new crop side. If you remember back in May, uh, they had actually lowered the yield from what their February outlook forum suggested, which was a bit of a surprise. I think at this point, they'll pause, they'll wait to see additional crop data uh, before they really adjust the supply side in that June report. So it's really going to be a conversation about how do the old crop uh, supply and demand balance sheets change uh, if you look at the cash market, domestically, things are red hot. Uh, the ethanol uh, margins uh, are robust. You've got soybean crush margins that have come off a fair amount, but they're still positive. And so the cash market's telling you that grain supplies are tight for old crops. So will the USDA acknowledge that further uh, in the June S&D next Friday the 10th? 
uh, that would be something to be watching for. All right, Luke, as we like to do to round out our market segment, any piece of risk management advice or recommendations you're offering to producers this time of year? Well, we mentioned that the cash markets are pretty hot. If you look at, you know, uh, basis values across the state, you're seeing strong overs in a lot of your key ethanol processing points. Uh, you're also seeing rail values really start to perk up uh, as feed markets to the west and south are really uh, pulling on, on the corn pipeline as well. Uh, if you remember back a year ago, the cash markets really peaked about this time a year ago. It was the middle of June before things started to break. Uh, so if you're a hedger and you're sitting on hedged inventory as a producer, you really need to be taking a look at that and probably liquidating that ownership soon. Uh, beyond that, if you have flat price risk, you know, seasonally, these markets really turn uh, once you get to the 4th of July. So I'd really encourage producers to be looking for an opportunity to shed old crop length in the next 30 days. And additionally, ask yourself the question, how much of my crop do I want to have marketed before harvest if you are a forward seller? If you are a forward seller, we would encourage you to get to that level in the next 30 to 40 days before these seasonal start to turn. Of course, we had you know a blip in the road uh, so far this week with really weak price action, but really no weather premium in this market should something develop. I uh, would expect that this market would snap back and provide some opportunities pretty quickly. But have your finger on the trigger, be ready to go. Uh, as this week shows, these, these markets can move pretty quick, so don't take them for granted. Thanks again to Luke for his time this week. Coming up next week, we'll be joined by Heather Ramsey from the ARC Group. As always, if you have a question you'd like for me to ask one of our green analysts, feel free to email us, or you can always get in touch with us on social media, and I'll be sure to pass those questions along. I mentioned earlier in the show that we're coming to you today from the grounds of this year's Cattlemen's Ball. This annual event has become one of the Midwest's premier events, which raises millions of dollars for cancer research. Each year it is held in a different and unique location, as the ball gives host communities the opportunity to showcase their area of the state. The community of Weeping Water, Nebraska has come together this year to make the event possible. Scott Lubin is one of the co-chairs with his wife, helping to spearhead the massive event. We had the opportunity to catch up with him earlier this week. Well, this is a massive undertaking to host the Cattlemen's Ball of Nebraska. Shed a light on just some of the work that's, that's gone into making this happen. Well, it's actually been a two-year process for us, Bryce. Of course, we were supposed to host in 21, uh, and Columbus uh, got theirs delayed, so we became a uh, 22 host. And so we've kind of been in the workings for 18 months now with getting committees and everything like that all lined up. Um, anybody, obviously, that comes out here and anybody that's been on the website can see all the different activities and things that are going on. So lots of different committees for people to get the chance to be involved with. Uh, and those that come out here get a chance to see what it is all about. So. Let's uh, just hit on some of the highlights. Of course, uh, it started on Friday and continues uh, on Saturday. There's kind of two different ticket levels, but for somebody coming out to the Saturday elements, what are some of the highlights? So I think the Saturday is uh, the one obviously that parlays into uh, you know the biggest attraction here. Obviously we have the headline entertainment on Saturday night, uh, but it certainly doesn't start there. Uh, it opens up with a uh, farm and ranch auction, opening ceremonies, uh, a style show in the afternoon, uh, and then of course we have the meal uh, starting at five o'clock, prime rib, uh, followed by three musical acts. Lucas Miner is going to lead off. Uh, the headliner is John Michael Montgomery on Saturday night. And then uh, Ned Ledoux will perform afterwards in the saloon tent. So looks for a full day of activity on Saturday afternoon. No doubt about that. Got the, the big prime rib supper as well. The pure logistics that goes in behind the scenes. It, it's tough to imagine feeding that much prime rib to that many people. Uh, and to that, how did ticket sales go this year? So you're exactly right. You know, as a, as a connoisseur of beef, which I consider myself to be, and then, you know, we just uh, know what all goes into it. And then when you're talking about preparing that for four or 5,000 people and getting them through in a timely fashion, it is, you know, a number one experience, and we're thankful to have a wonderful caterer with us this year to be able to do that again. Um, you know, it just, uh, obviously the ball, one of the things it does is promotes beef uh, in Nebraska. It's so important to us, and so uh, we just welcome that chance to be able to do that, so. Absolutely. Well, we're raising money for, for cancer research. 90% of the proceeds raised out here at the Cattlemen's Ball of Nebraska will go to UNMC and the work that's happening at the Cancer Research Center there. 10% stays local to help with some local initiatives there. Why does this cause matter to you? Well, this cause is really special to us. Uh, my wife and I have been, uh, you know, especially touched. Uh, I lost my dad 
uh, when he was about my age now, and uh, he died from stomach cancer. Uh, my wife just lost her mom this winter uh, from a colon cancer, and so obviously that runs in our family very, very deep and uh, has always meant something to us. Uh, when the opportunity came for us to step up and be able to host and raise this money for cancer research, uh, it was hard to, to say no to that. I mean, it just any opportunity we had that is gonna you know, hopefully change the lives of somebody else down the road because of what we're doing here this weekend, it, it makes it all worthwhile. Well, it takes a village to make these kinds of things happen, and in this case, uh, a number of villages <laughs> yes. that are surrounding here. Talk about the volunteer effort to make this happen. So, I, as I said earlier, we're a little bit different here in the fact that it's actually held on our county fairgrounds. So it is. It's it's a countywide experience as opposed to just uh, you know one community. And so we have relied on uh, staff and and uh, volunteers from all over, uh, even in the surrounding counties as well, that have contributed to come up here and do this. Mm -hmm. And just the, uh, just the willingness for them to come together uh, and commit to doing that as a fundraiser is, you know, A number one. You mentioned it is obviously a fundraiser and you guys had a pretty ambitious goal this year, didn't you? We did. Uh, we wanted to be the biggest and raise the most uh, that we could this year. And, uh, and so we set out for in excess of $2 million that we wanted to raise. Uh, and as you said earlier, of course, 90% of that goes directly to uh, the Pamela Buffett Cancer Center uh, just for cancer research. You know, that's the interesting thing that people sometimes don't understand is that money isn't used to pay the bills, pay the utilities, and everything like that. It's just for cancer research. So. Well, I was joking with you as we're kind of making the final preparations ahead of this year's ball that uh, ask you, you know, as everything come together, you're looking forward to this being all done. You said, you know, when the end, that's when you can kind of smile again when you know all the hard work has gone into a successful event. But what are you most excited about for, for hosting the ball this year? Well, I'm just, I'm excited for two reasons. One of which is, as I'm a member of the Cass County Ag Society Board, and we're pretty proud of our facilities out here. Uh, you know, we think they probably stock up to most any facilities in the state. And so we want to be able to showcase that. Uh, but being able to use that uh, as a fundraiser for something like this, I think makes it that much more important and, and it gives the people the chance to, to see what we have. So. Thanks to Scott for taking the time to discuss this year's event with us. If you'd like more information on the Cattleman's Ball as well as next year's plan, you can visit the website cattlemansball.com. Nettleman Dairy near Stromsburg has been around since the early 1950s and they continue today with Jason Nettleman, his father Doug and brother Scott and Greg. The 270 cow crossbred dairy milks three times a day and includes crossbred cows that are Holstein in Jersey with some experimenting and crossbreeding with the Norwegian Red. The family dairy operation is extremely frugal and they work hard to improve efficiencies in order to keep the business thriving. You can learn more about the family dairy in the June issue of the Nebraska Farmer. Well, it is now time for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, how are things looking as we turn to the week ahead? Well, Bryce, so this last week we've seen those warm temperatures during the Memorial Day weekend, and of course this thunderstorm activity primarily concentrated more in western Nebraska than eastern Nebraska as most of that energy lifted out of that trough up into the northern plains. One to two and a half inches of moisture was reported across the panhandle. Heaviest of that was north of the river, north of the Platte River system. As you got into the southwestern portion of the panhandle, precipitation totals dropped off, but a decent event for that region. Also seen some scattered pockets of anywhere from a half an inch to an inch in the western half of southwest Nebraska, scattered throughout the northern, Pan or northern sand hills and also in portions of northeast Nebraska. Much of central, south central, and east central Nebraska is fairly much left high and dry with these systems. Now we're gonna see a very active pattern over this next week. Multiple chances for precipitation, not every single day, but the cumulative totals will should leave most of the state anywhere from three quarters of an inch to around two and a quarter inches of moisture for this period, with the heaviest basically hitting southwestern Nebraska. Now as we look at the upper air pattern, we currently have an upper air low sitting over southern Canada that keeps us in, a, in a basically a northwest to almost zonal flow, and that means systems are gonna rapidly move across our region. We have a low pressure over northeastern portions of New Mexico that's gonna help moisture lift north and then basically up toward the northwest to create upflow flow. So we're gonna see scattered thunderstorm activity across the west and then it'll move east as we go into tomorrow. 
You see that lobe move toward the western Great Lakes. A little wave moves across the northern plains underneath of it. That should help to generate some moisture as we have low pressure basically still in northeastern Colorado bringing that moisture up. Biggest concentration of moisture in the southwest in portions of north central Nebraska. And then on Monday we get a zonal flow. Waves will move rather quickly in this type of a scenario. Not a lot of precipitation expected during the Monday period as low pressure will now move at the surface into central portions of Texas and that will keep the big fish feed of moisture up toward the central corn belt. And then on Tuesday we see another ripple starting to develop and also an intensification of the northern, uh, the trough to the north of us. That will help to create a convergence zone basically from the central plains to the southern plains so we should start to see thunderstorm activity across Kansas and some of it in western Nebraska and more concentrated as we get in Wednesday as this trough itself deepens into our region and brings very cool air into our area. That convergence zone should develop widespread precipitation across much of Nebraska and Iowa and as that system pushes to the east we will start to see a cooler trend for a couple days and much drier conditions. On Thursday we start to see the northwest flow aloft and high pressure at the surface building in. That pushes the rainfall back toward our south and as we start to see this rainfall to our south that trough will start to deepen and progress pushing a little bit farther toward the west. That's going to help systems move down the front side of this ridge and that means that as the high pressure builds in even deeper it's going to push moisture up against the mountains. That creates an upslope flow condition and we may see some good thunderstorm activity from the Panhandle through southwestern Nebraska. Look farther into the future, 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday through following Tuesday. That cool air remains in place and in terms of precipitation, near normal to probably slightly above normal precipitation isn't going to occur. Thanks Al. Finally today, as corn is emerging, producers should never assume that protection is guaranteed for their crops. Producers need to be alert to the potential for damage from early season insects, such as cutworms and other insects. Market Journal's Mike Straub recently caught up with extension entomologist Bob Wright to discuss some mitigation tactics that could prove beneficial for their operations. With crops emerging, early season soil insects are something to be looking out for. There's a couple of different insects that, that can damage corn early. And I guess the main thing to watch for or assess when you're in the field is what type of insect it is, because that can influence management decisions. There's some early season insects like wireworms and white grubs and seed corn maggots where there's no rescue treatment. So the decision mainly is whether or not to replant and to understand what the problem is so you can plan to avoid it in the future. There are some other insects, primarily cutworms, that uh, feed above ground. And if they're severe enough, we can use insecticides to try to reduce the injury. Uh, if we are dealing with cutworms, it's important to identify which species are present and their size. Particularly the size is important because that can tell us how much longer they're gonna feed and uh, whether it's going to be too late to treat in some cases. When trying to identify if you have an early season insect infestation, there are different characteristics for different insects to be looking out for. A couple of things. Uh, one thing would be uh, gaps in the stand. Some of the insects like wireworms or seed corn maggots can actually kill the seed before it emerges. And so you need to dig up uh, where the seed was and see if you can find insects. Uh, other, other insects like the cutworms, uh, there may be some leaf feeding initially and obviously if the plant is cut at the base that's an indication of cutworm probably. There can also be uh, growth distortions, uh, the wireworms can feed at the base of the plant and, and disturb the growing point or it could be plant wilting from damage of the, of the roots uh, from some of these early season pests. Not all soil insects can be controlled in the same way. It is important to find out early if there is an infestation issue to protect your crops. Some insects, there's no uh, post-plant insecticide that's available, particularly the soil insects. We don't have any in insecticides that would be active against the soil insects. Uh, the, there's a variety of insecticides can be used for cutworms. Uh, and so that, that would be something, if you do have cutworms, there is a potential to use insecticides to control them. An insect infestation can quickly become an economic liability. 
Knowing where an insect is in its life cycle is important to identify quickly. Damages these insects inflict on crops could potentially mean replanting is in order. In some cases, preparing for next season is the best option. There's two different decisions. One is the replant decision, and uh, if the corn stand across the field or a portion of the field is, is so low that there's definitely going to be a decreased yield potential, it may, may pay to re replant. In terms of cutworm injury, we usually have a guideline if you have three to five percent of plants that are cut and uh, not productive, that may warrant a treatment to prevent further damage. And again, knowing what size the cutworms are is important in terms of how much longer they're going to be feeding. Uh, cutworms and all caterpillars do most of their feeding damage in the last couple of stages. So most of the cutworms we have in Nebraska can get up to an inch and a half long at, at maturity. So if they're over an inch long, it may be by the time you get out to spray, it may be too late to treat. I think the main take home message is to uh, assess whether what type of insect damage you have and whether it's a treatment, whether it's a, uh, an insect that you can still treat for or whether it's just something you need to take note of for next year and plan for next year. Early season soil insects are just one of many aspects to be looking out for when examining your crops. Identifying which insects is causing the issue, where it is in its life cycle, and understanding early when to treat or replant are some of the biggest takeaways. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Mike Straub. Thanks for that report, Mike. If you like more information on early season scouting and insect damage prevention, you can find that and more online at the Crop Watch website, cropwatch.unl.edu. Well, that is going to do it for another episode of Market Drill. We'd like to thank the organizers of this year's Cattleman's Ball for allowing us to take part in this weekend's event and for hosting us for this week's broadcast. Remember, if you did miss a story, be sure to follow Market Journal on YouTube and are on our social media accounts to join in on the conversation. We hope to see you right back here next time. Until then, I'm Bryce Duskett. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter. Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.